Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 26. This is kind of the one-year anniversary of the podcast, even though I think there's a... I think it's supposed to be next week. I don't know. Weeks. How do they work? We've got the normal gang here today with me. I should I should mention, I've noticed in editing that I'm not mentioning my own name. You have a name. I do have a name. Are you sure you're here? I... I mean, as maybe, sure... Maybe you are entirely pre-recorded. In a Cartesian sense, yes. I am very certain. What about in a philosophical sense? That is a Cartesian. That's Descartes. <laughs> but that's a mathematical term for a grid. Come on. Did well, Descartes in, invent in, grids? In a hyperbolic sense? No, Cartesian means... Like, it, it references Descartes. A parabolic sense? As far as I know, then Descartes just was good at drawing straight lines. I think we're putting Descartes in front of the horse here. Let's introduce everyone. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark. With me today is Orion. Hello. Matt. Ring, ring. And Ben. Hello. You guys are going to make me edit out so much on this. Today we are <laughs> Today we are talking about real-time games, specifically two of our favorites, Space Alert from the greatest board game designer ever, Vlada Kavadal, and Captain Sonar from designers whose names I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> oh man, we're in a horrible mood tonight. <laughs> but we both enjoy, we, we all enjoy both of these games, and I think it's really interesting to compare them because they're both real-time cooperative team games now the main difference is that in captain sonar of course you're on two teams playing against each other and space alert is a more traditional co-op everyone against the game situation but i want to point out what they do well what they don't do well compare them and see how the experiences compare between the two starting with space alert now I don't think I'm alone at this table when I say that Space Alert is there one of the best of games ever made. Okay, so let's just start <laughs> this off the top. Space Alert is in your top 10, and it is our favorite co-op game of all time. Yes? I, no. I mean, Gloomhaven's Gloom co-op, Spirit Island's oh, co-op. Okay, but the, yeah. well, s since the last time we did, in the last list. Yeah. Excluding games from the last year, I would agree with you. Mage Knight's kind of co-op, not exclusively, but... Okay, well... We like co-op games. Space Alert has been in my top five for a long time. It is definitely still top ten material. Yeah. It's Ye something... I think at, at one point, a number of us said it might not be our favorite game, but it'd be the game we're least likely to say no to. We also, I think, agreed that it is the game that best creates a sense of teamwork. So it best embraces the spirit of cooperation as it were. Now I want a spirit for Spirit Island called the Spirit of Cooperation. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just posted my Spirit Island review uh, like an hour ago, and I'm still thinking about that game. Go see that review if you if you haven't. It's truly an amazing game, but so is Space Alert. We're going to talk about Space Alert and not Spirit Island. Anyway, it creates a sense of teamwork, and it creates a sense of cooperation, I think, unique to most games, even... Even, I think, comparing to Captain Sonar. But let's talk about what it is if you haven't played it before. It is, as we said before, a real-time game, a team game. It is a programming game. So in the main phase of the game, you're, you have hands of cards. And they will have different actions, uh, either actions or movements on them. And you have a track of 12 different spaces for those cards in throughout the game in the 10 to 15 minute real time section, you're going to be playing those cards on a programming line, basically on a, on, a, on a timeline. And that's going to show what you're going to do in each discrete phase. So when you resolve that later, after everyone's played everything and you've, and you've done all your actions, you resolve everything one step at a time, one through 12 in the real time phase. You have, uh, it comes with a CD. Now there's an app, of course, to, make things a lot easier because what's a cd I, man I, when's the last time i used a cd to play space alert two years ago <laughs> that's probably <laughs> it anyway there's a track that plays and it'll say things like external threat zone blue two and that says it's 
there's a, a spaceship coming to attack you on your attack the spaceship that you're on the uss sitting duck and it's coming it, it appears in the time phase two and it's attacking the blue zone so the spaceship the, on the main playboard is divided into red, white, and blue zones, the left, right, and, or left, middle, and right, and they're going to attack one of those zones. And so someone has to flip over a card that's uh, the, from the threat pile and look at it and it communicate to the rest of the group what that ship actually does. So there's a whole pile of different cards of different attacking ships, and they all have different movement speeds, they have different shields, they have different health, and they do various things whenever they hit certain sections of the track. So say a ship has three movement, every turn after it appears, it'll move three spaces, and if it hits a certain spot, maybe it'll attack two, or it'll attack four, or it'll boost its shields, or it will heal other ships on other tracks, or it'll phase into a different zone for the more complicated ones, or it does damage in all zones. It, it, there's a whole variety of different things that the ships do, and you have to figure out how to defeat them using the, the guns on, on your ship, and or, or survive them just by putting up enough shields and taking the damage that it deals if it's not going to be lethal. There are also internal uh, threats, which just appear on your ship. So aliens that come on and attack, or commandos, and then you have different ways of dealing with that, with robots that are planted on board. Or even, like, broken systems. Or, or yeah, even systems on the ship will break. Like, the shields will go down, and you have to keep hitting buttons to make everything get back to normal. Because one of the things about Space Alert is that the entire spaceship you're operating is operated by either the a b or c button in, in each room life. just like in real life and so in that sense it's a complicated game because you're trying to figure out exactly what's going on and i think that's interesting that it takes the challenge of trying to read the text on a card and integrates that into the challenge of the game uh, but it also has ultimately really simple mechanisms where you play a card and you either move a spot or or you press a very large A, B, or C button in whatever room you're in. Yeah, that that's a great point. There, there are those moments, if, if you're the person responsible for understanding an incoming ship, there's that like 10 seconds where you're intensely reading the card, depending on how complicated it is, which is kind of like a very like not real-time thing to do. But it's a, it's a great moment where you're trying to understand so that you can tell everyone else what they need to do to handle that. Yeah, but let's talk now about what Space Alert does well. To repeat myself again, it does teamwork well, but I think it does it specifically because it forces you into taking roles. So we do it where someone takes the external threats and has to has to read out those. Another person takes the internal threats, and then maybe a third person takes care of the energy resources that you have to manipulate, and then the fourth person just kind of keeps track of the overall picture. And wiggling the mouse. And wiggling the mouse, I should I should mention that one of the things in Space Alert. Okay, this game's hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's it might be the funniest board game we have. It's amazing. One of the things you have to do once per phase, of which there are three, is go and it's actually not wiggling the mouse. That's a colloquialism we invented. It's actually hitting the space bar on the keyboard to it's, prevent it's, the. It's hitting the giant C button in the cockpit. Yes, which True. presses the space bar. To prevent the screensaver on the ship from turning on and deactivating all of the systems for a turn. When I believe it's explained as a contractual obligation to the mission's sponsor yeah, that it's like their screensaver with their logo comes up. Yes, so that's an important thing. The other important thing in this game that I didn't mention is that once per phase, the game records how many times you go to the middle bottom space and do visual confirmation which is just looking out the window and you get extra points if multiple people look out the window simultaneously which is it's it's just perfect well it just it's a perfect mechanism yeah and and everything about the game kind of the cartoon artwork and the rule book which is incredibly written um, and hilarious and has a really detailed tutorial actually it like forces you into the humor in a sense does that make sense well, it integrates the humor into the gameplay in that yeah, it's right. funny that you put down a card and it shows the, a 
picture of a giant button on it. It's like, oh, I'm pressing this button now. The window thing specifically is hilarious because I think even if it didn't give points, we'd still try to look out it because it's there. You want to do something hilariously useless, but there have been situations in which in our rush to all look out the window simultaneously, we have actually caused ourselves to lose the game. It's happened. Because of our greed. It's like the stupidest element of hubris ever put into a game. There's... And it's genius. I would also like to say that I, for my first character upgrade, I rushed the super good at looking out the window upgrade. Oh, yeah. As the most important, clearly the most important upgrade that I could get. It's really important looking out the window, guys. Usually, every part of this game is hysterical. Yeah. So I think it does a good job of bringing together the teamwork and just pushing people into different roles because, again, it takes something that is oftentimes frustrating in games, that is interpreting card text or interpreting symbology or abbreviations, and makes that literally part of the challenge of the game in a fun way. That if you pick, if you're the person reading the threat cards and you look at a card and you honestly can't figure it out, you have to then go distract someone else who may be on a train of thought and try to get them to see if you're interpreting it correctly. And then that's even more panic inducing and it can spiral out of control like that. But that's exactly the fun of the game is trying to prevent the team from spiraling out of control. And I think the key to all of this is that you have to do it in real time and you're listening to a track and that throws a threat at you every minute and you only have 10 minutes to do all of your programming for the whole game uh, and you're not going to know information until, you know, the eighth minute or something. So you have to interpret these cards, figure out where they're going to appear, when they're in range, which weapons can you fire, do you have energy for them, can people get in range, oh, did is someone still available to go press the mouse button or to wiggle the mouse to to you know keep the the screensaver off. Oh, we need to recharge the reactor and there's so much information going on at the same time that one person can't just quarterback the whole thing and say, "All right, you do this, you do this and ruin the game" because there's too much going on and that's that's what really forces you into these roles and forces you to communicate with people because you have to divide the labor. It's the only way to win. Right, and that's the that's the, the brilliance of it is that it, it tackles the quarterbacking problem in such an elegant way that it doesn't introduce any mechanisms specifically to stop it. It's just that's part of how the game operates. I think one of my favorite things about Space Alert is that you have all of these interruptions to your your flow. The soundtrack has frequent interruptions of static that prevents you from speaking with your with your fellow crewmates uh it has uh data transfers when you can trade cards and it, it's like all of these things which sometimes are good things but you still have to stop and take stock and then you try to get back to where you were and like oh wait what was i trying to do and I, I think it's a really a really fun way that it emulates life in that you know life is life is busy and confusing and a lot of the time you don't you, you can't just focus on on, on one thing, on like, like you do in a lot of other board games. Yeah, and it puts the time pressure on you, which I, I wish there was someone in our group who... This sounds bad. I, I wish there was someone in the group who didn't like Space Alert so I could get the perspective of someone who can't handle the stress of it. Because that's clearly the big downside to the game, is that if you cannot handle time stress, or if you can, but you just don't enjoy it, like you don't enjoy that kind of stress you're not going to enjoy Space Alert. Although, if you are playing with more experienced players, it's fairly easy to kind of take the load a little bit off of someone and give them guidance, especially on kind of base level difficulties. And, and it's interesting thinking back to when we weren't playing with the expansion, because if you've read my review of Space Alert, I think I include a little bit on the expansion there. It's one of the best expansions I've ever seen in that it provides more interesting things and it makes the game harder when it needs to be harder once you've played out the base game, which which isn't going to happen quickly. We played the, the original quite a bit before we found it to be starting to get a little too easy. And it introduces the character aspects, which is just like icing on the top where you can 
gain special ability cards and such. But thinking back to when we were playing the base game and getting fairly confident at it, we were to the point where like I could probably play three characters fairly well. So in that sense, like quarterbacking wasn't eliminated at that point, but we were at a point where we needed the expansion. I think we played once, or I played once with all new people, or was it four? I don't know. I think it was all new people, and I was able to mostly tell people enough like to get them going, and I had enough spare cycles to handle my character and be able to give advice to other people, and I try to avoid quarterbacking, I think, as we all do, but in that specific game with all new people, I was able to look at what someone else was doing, evaluate it quickly enough to be able to give advice or suggestions or feedback on that and within the time constraints well and one thing i didn't mention about the expansion is that it introduces double action cards so in the original game each space on your 12 point track you do one thing with the expansion cards each card on one half has one action but on the other half has a combination of two actions and that by itself, I think, makes the game. Once you get to that point where the you've got the the, the original game handled, that by itself is yeah, you, such a fascinating challenge. Just in, in terms of difficulty curve, you're then expected to do about one and a half times what you were doing before. And, well, and even then, they resolve in order, which is critically important. And there's that many more enemies. So, like, if the base track might have five threats, the double action track has seven or eight. I I wanted to say. This game also has a great difficulty slider in that for each deck of challenges, there are there are two external decks, regular threats and, and serious, serious threats. threats. Yeah. So there are two external decks, and then there are two internal decks, regular and, and serious. But within each of those, there are three levels of difficulty for for each. With card. the expansion. The original game only has two levels. Oh, is that yeah, the red? Oh, okay. the, the red threats are in the expansion. Okay, okay, that's true. But but even with the regular game, there was some scaling where you would start with white, then you would go mixed white yellow, and then you could go up to yellow. And now that we've been playing this for like two and a half years or whatever, we're still not adding in the red threads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The difficulty and the complexity of it ramps up that much. But but that's my point. Like As soon as you get to a spot where quarterbacking might be an issue, that's when you can just up the difficulty or buy the expansion and then up the difficulty a ridiculous amount and, uh, and up the complexity of it. Because again, a big part of the difficulty of the game is just analyzing what the state of the game is. Like figuring out where your character is and figuring out what the enemies are going to do and communicating that into actions. And I think there's an interesting tipping point in our games, I think, that demonstrates when you're at the right difficulty in the game, in that, if I remember correctly, when back when we were playing only the base game, we were to a point where we could kind of, as Ryan said, take a glance at someone's board uh, or take a glance or, or get an idea of what they have in their hand and say, okay, you should go blue, then down, then do, then hit C to launch the missile or something like that. And in that sense, you can look at a person's position and, and give them very discreet actions of what to do. When we're playing a challenging game, the communication needs to be, okay, you need to accomplish this. Like, you need to shoot the red gun twice, and then you have to leave it up to the other person to figure out precisely how to get there and do that. And then you got to confirm, okay, you're shooting it twice on 6 and 7, right? No, I can't get there on 6 and 7. Can anyone else get there for 6 and 7? And then they got to stop what they're doing, figure out if they can get there for 6 and 7. And if not, you got to have to reevaluate the whole plan. So when the game's going well the communication strategy is results oriented rather than process oriented and right. that's so cool because you have to trust the other people to figure out how to, the process they need to take to get to those results or communicate to you that they can't do it with the cards they have it also creates this wonderfully depressing moment as you're resolving the game <laughs> when you realize you just completely messed up and you're on the wrong deck, and you didn't fire that gun when you told someone else you did. 
you went right when you told everyone you went left yeah or you just both happened you both used the elevator on the same round and then everything just spirals out out of control from there yeah the elevator rule that's one of those like vlada touches that i think another designer wouldn't have thought to do it's those those little tiny rules that make the game you know a little more fiddly but they're just mean. Yeah, how's it work? Basically, you if can't, you can't people, share an elevator. Yeah, you can't share an elevator. So if two people are sh- are changing vertically decks on the same turn, one of them is delayed, which means all their cards get pushed back around. The second person. The second, second person, person yeah. yeah. And there's just little stuff like that. Like, you know, every gun in the game can reach a specific distance you know, the the whole distance. So if a ship is out there, they can shoot it, except for the missiles and this one particular gun. And, you know, in other designers, maybe they would have made it a bit more elegant and had not had range at all. But Vlada wants to put that in there, so you shoot the missile like a turn early, and then you're like, oh, I miscalculated how fast that ship was yeah, going to move, no, and now the missile doesn't land, they're... which was part of our calculations for destroying that ship, which snowballs into damage. Yeah. There are just innumerable ways that you can just fail, but they're all hilarious, yeah. and when you're resolving it, like losing feels really good in this game. It does. It, it's occasionally incredibly frustrating, it but it's so still fun. It, isn't this the game that you like? You said you got more emotional, or what, what did you say? Well, remember one time we had Abiola over, and we we're playing the game with him, and I was at a point. We we're at a point where we really we had like a losing streak or something, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna push the team to victory this time. So I came up with plans and strategies, and it just fell apart, and I just. I got mad. I think I scared Abiola from ever playing this game again. You you want to win so bad. And let's start comparing it now to a, a little bit to Captain Sonar. Because one of the main distinctions I think we're getting at here with Space Alert is that if you fail in Space Alert, you might not realize it for f- 15 minutes until you get to that point in the resolution. Because what it does is you have this rapid hectic 10 or 15 minutes of figuring out your actions and then they're all played face down so you can't it's hard to in time consuming to look back and at certain points you can't change things you did in the past so you kind of lock them in as you go and have to trust yourself that you did what you thought you did with that action and then very methodically (laughs) you spend about 10 minutes going step by step by step and re- resolving everything precisely. And if you screwed up in turn four, you realize, you start to realize the implications of being just like one deck over was to everything else you did in your track because everything is dependent on everything else. And it's that like creeping horror or the doubt the inevitable doubt you feel as soon as every mission's over or the overconfidence we're like oh we think we got this nailed down really well creeping doubt into inevitable horror (laughs) is pretty much a perfect description (laughs) when things go wrong yeah and then and then captain sonar doesn't really have that in captain sonar if you make a mistake you feel the you get the punishment for that mistake immediately well, we should talk a little bit about Captain Sonar. Yeah, maybe. yeah. let's talk about Captain Sonar. So Captain Sonar, as I said before, is a team versus team game. Ideally, you'll have teams, two teams of four each, and each of them takes a very specific role. There's the captain, there's the radar operator, the first mate, and the engineer. And each of them has a very specific role, and instead of playing cards, all the action in Captain Sonar is done with laminated boards essentially and little dry erase markers and so the captain is determining where on the map the submarine is moving and when they fire mines or torpedoes the radio operator or the sonar operator is listening to the opposing captain and marking down where the enemy has moved uh, and trying to figure out where they could be on the map because they don't know their starting position the first mate controls powering up different systems and the engineer controls the slow but inevitable deterioration of the ship that happens every time they move 
So systems will frequently break down and the engineer is, has a little mini game going to try to reactivate systems and repair the ship. And that's essentially it. Once you're moving around the space, you're trying to figure out where the other submarine is. And once you do that, you try to shoot them with your torpedoes or with your mines. So it's really a race between the opposing captains and radio operators to try to figure out where they are first. And there are a couple abilities to help with that. You have the sonar ability. Is that the one with the true and false? I can't. Uh, I thought sonar was a section and then drone. The drone is the true or false. And, yeah. and those are the two green actions. Those are the ways you can kind of narrow down where they might be. So one of them lets you ask if the opposing sub is in a particular region of the map. The map's divided into nine regions on a square map. And so they have to say yes or no. The other one, they have to give two coordinates, region x-axis or y-axis, and one of them is true. The other one is false, which is... Honestly, the hardest part of the game is being a captain and getting hit with that and trying to figure out a reasonable lie <laughs> <laughs> that won't make it apparent which one is the true statement. And you're just going around charging systems and dodging and weaving and trying to figure out what they are and shooting them down. So it tends to be a lot of moving around and little pokes here and there with the different location mechanisms and then this kind of sudden assault where hopefully you could destroy them before they escape. There's a couple things that allow them to escape more easily. But we found, at least in our first few games, that once someone figures out the precise location of a sub, they're dead. Like, you you inevitably get to them. That's interesting, because you've played this more than I have, and I think it's been about 50-50 in my games. But you think more often you're able to finish off the sub at once rather than... Because in my games, it's kind of been two rounds. Like the damage the first time you you encounter is like basically half of the health. But then you kind of go back and you have to find them again. What I found is that you hit them once and maybe it's an indirect hit that takes a quarter of their health. Or maybe it's a direct hit that does half. And they use their ability to sneak away so they can do a movement a special movement activating an ability that lets them move up to four spaces i believe undetected yeah uh so it's not announced like every other movement and then within a minute or two you end up finding them again uh and shooting them down i found it's very hard to, to escape but that might be something that you get better at as the game progresses uh, but that's how that's how captain sonar operates and in the point of comparison I was saying before, like, if you fail in Captain Sonar, if, or if you screw up, you get shot, and you know that immediately, and then you have to scramble to try to recover from that, which is very, very difficult. And I think I prefer... I, I, I wouldn't say that's a bad mechanism. I just think Space Alert's system of slowly revealing the consequences of what you did and seeing the snowball effect of one little mistake... And then maybe sometimes surviving that mistake, but usually not, I think is so much more engaging than all of a sudden being hit. Although I guess the suspense, I, it, it's, it's, the suspense in Captain Sonar is just during the the initial stages of the, the game. game where it, it's an neither. In, it's an intense head to head experience, and, and that's yeah, that's a very different intensity than Space Alert has. Yeah, I know, uh, especially as the captain role in Captain Sonar, the namesake, I suppose, you really feel on the pressure of you, it's yeah. you and this other captain, and you're trying to go faster than them and figure out where they are before they find you. Yeah, that's something I pointed out in my review of Captain Sonar that I kind of understand why they did it, but I kind of don't like it, is that the captain role and the radio operator role are so much more difficult than the other two that I feel like you only really feel like you're playing the game fully if you're in one of those roles because the other two roles just don't care about the map. I don't know. There's an element of truth to that, but it's almost like playing a support role in like an RPG or I don't know. You guys, yeah, that makes sense. You're playing your own little mini game. I just don't it's, think they're as interesting as the as the game the other two are playing. It's not, but then again, like usually you're gonna play two or three rounds of this, so you switch it up. And I I don't know. Yeah, and, well, and the reason I think they do that is just so that you that you can put 
someone who's new at the game in the first mate role and you're like, okay, check off these things and that's all they have to do. And it helps them helps you introduce newer people or or makes the game more accessible to varying skill levels than if every role was critically important like those two. I think that is very good to do. And I think I came to Space Alert later than you guys did. And my first, I don't know, my first four or five games, I was basically just like completely lost. And I think it was, it wasn't really, you know, Space Alert, you can't have that quarterbacking. But I, I felt like I was always asking, what should I do? And I didn't really get a grip on it until a few games. Really, I don't feel like I got a good grip on it until I played a couple solo missions. And I think Captain Sonar kind of helps ease you into it a little bit more because you can fully understand what you're doing in the first mate's role or in the engineering role pretty easily. And I don't even think the the captain's role or the, the, um, the radio operator's role... I don't think they're that complicated. I, I think no, they're not. The, the captain role is the intense. captain role. The captain role is definitely the most difficult. Even even the captain's role, I think it's with you know you, you probably want to play it a couple times, but I, I think it's 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 easy to understand what you're doing. The difference is the role itself isn't that hard. It's just the punishment for not being tactically good is is really intense and really like immediate. Yeah. Right, yeah. The importance of the chairs is heavily weighted on the captain. And just in terms of like a player personality point of view, coming into the game, you have to be okay taking on the weight of that and the stress of that role, you know, this kind of real time back and forth, you know, hidden race to to play that role. And the first time you're going to be awkward and you don't know what you're doing, and I've played it I don't know enough times that I've, I'm more comfortable being the captain now, but it's it, the I don't know the difference between this and and Space Alert is that I don't know if I could play Space Alert with my parents, but I was able to play Captain Sonar with them, and they played I think all the other three roles aside from Captain, and they enjoyed it. You know, my sister played, and we had a great time. We I don't know we played four or five times I think, and we had a great time playing. Whereas with Space Alert. We might have played once, maybe twice, but it would have been too much for them, I think, to take on just because there's so many things going on. Yeah. And maybe you just have to go through the tutorial again with brand new players that aren't used to that sort of thing. But that becomes really boring for experienced people. Kevin somewhere honestly has like an interesting... It's not a quarterbacking problem, like some of the roles being more important. It's almost a quarterbacking problem problem but it's 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 built into it's a feature right it's a quarterbacking is a feature not a bug in that game exactly yeah um i don't know like you talk about your family i i think i think my uh my ember like captain sonar better than space alert yeah and 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 my comments didn't have to be captain and my comments are heavily weighted in to the kind of games i enjoy which are games that typically require a bit of sacrifice on the initial play <laughs> like i don't i don't mind a rules barrier or a difficulty barrier right and so i i don't weigh that as heavily as as many other people would so more than most things i say that's extremely subjective to my tastes and ha- having having said that i think i mean maybe i have to play captain sonar more but right now like having played space alert enough i think space alert is a very rewarding game and I don't know that Captain Sonar, while it is fun, I don't I don't know that it will ever reach quite the same depth as as Space Alert has for me. I don't think it'll reach the same depth just because it's not as complex it's or is or as. I think it reaches a greater depth because you're underwater. <laughs> but in space, there are no directions, so who's to say what is depth and what is up? Deep space. There you go. Is depth just? Distance from the home planet. What is depth? Height. I would say it's. It's more safe height. to say that there is no sonar in space, <laughs> and no one hears you scream. That too, unless you're sufficiently close really, to a planet. My, Never mind. Really, my biggest criticism of uh, Captain Sonar is that you you're a team, but you're not a space team. <laughs> but but to the point of the rewarding nature of the game. I I tend to think that 
with a sufficient number of plays that still space alert would appear to be more rewarding. Although I think if you get to a per- a certain point of skill in Captain Sonar, you'll get past the problem I mentioned before, where once someone finds you, you're kind of toast unless you can retaliate really quick to where it could become like a more consistently a two phase game where you have the initial contact and then a lengthy you know, retreat, and then you have to try to find them again. And I think well, once other... you hit that point, I think the game becomes substantially more interesting. I mean, and the other thing is that in order to hit someone with a torpedo, you have to be close. But then the other person is close and can hit you with a torpedo. How often in playing it do you have scenarios where you hit the other sub, but then they're able to counterattack before you can reload your torpedoes? In my experience, it's not that often because usually there's there's a moment of stress there where once you get hit, where all of a sudden you have you start thinking of how to run away rather than how to counterattack. And maybe that's where we're not as skilled and we're not we're doing things strategically wrong. We're still fairly new at the game, but you tend to want to run away because you know you know for certain that they know where you are and you probably haven't because of the attack deduced where they are that doesn't give you enough information in the plays i've had one team generally has a better idea the team that shoots and hits generally has a better idea where the other uh, sub is than the sub that got hit and the other sub might then get an indirect hit off but then you both kind of sprint away and reset. So, I don't know. The, the team that gets hit tends to run away, and then you have to re-pick up the trail. And they know you were near them, so they start tracing your new path, your path from roughly that area. Yeah. Um, but I found that one team generally has a better idea. But I think with a sufficient amount of play and, and understanding of the game and how to utilize the skills effectively, I think you can get past that rhythm of the game. And I think that's where the game becomes much more interesting. We also haven't played any of the advanced maps or the special I, abilities I was going to ask. Um, I, I haven't. Um, I haven't you, even looked at just them. the basic one. I mean, I've looked through them, and they look really cool. So I guess it's almost unfair for us to talk about it. The first map is is really fun, and it's just the basic challenge of piloting a ship. It's hard enough playing the base map enough. as captain. Yeah, it's <laughs> exactly. I did look through the other maps, and there's a ramping of like different things that the different maps add uh, to the to the last one, where you're like playing under the ice. So there are only very particular places you can even surface. I think Space Alert is definitely more rewarding than the engineer or first mate roles. I think depending on what sorts of games you like, the captain and radio operator can be similar. Yeah, and well also I think when you get to the to a point like if you play with the same team a, f- a few times where you can have a a vocal shorthand like vocabulary to communicate with each other that would be really interesting in in captain sonar in sonar also on a purely mechanical level i think the surfacing mechanism is the best part of the game because when you want to heal your sub fully and the engineer becomes overwhelmed essentially you have to surface and when you do that or when you back yourself into a corner by plotting a, cor- a bad course. <laughs> yes, yeah, something I haven't done, but Orion has. You need to surface. And what that does is it clears your your previous path, which you cannot overlap your path. So you, you can't backtrack and you can't cross a line that you've already gone through, which which helps the radio operator. It clears that, but... You have to announce which of those nine segments on the map you're in. And then you have this silly mini game, which is oh, just so delightfully designed, where you just have to trace four shapes in between, like in between two lines and not exceed the limits of the line with your marker. And I think it's so perfect to have you do something that's like dexterously precise in exactly the highest moment of panic in the game. And so every person on the team has to do that, and you have to show the other team, and they have to approve that you didn't go past the lines, you stayed within the lines correctly, and then you heal everything, and then you can go back down and resume. That's the best moment in in Captain Sonar. I I think it's so well done that you have something so... It's such a break from 
what the normal flow of the game is. Yeah, and it's this moment of panic where you have to do something, again, really precise and really controlled. And you have to do it while the other team still is is all of a sudden moving very quickly to find you. So when you're in the radio operator role, you're like listening to to <laughs> command after command. You have to record that and then on the side quickly draw this line and listen at the same time. It's It's really, really well done. And I think that's the point in the game other than when you're in the captain role. For the other roles, that's the point of the game where it becomes most like Space Alert in its tension and uh, excitement. Otherwise, it's fairly... Well, it's suspenseful in a quiet way for the other roles because they're kind of slowly doing their thing. The captain's you know, trying to figure out, and the radio operator are trying to figure out where the other sub is as quickly as possible. But when you hit that submersion stage, everyone has the same panic which is do this thing as fast as possible. I love that part of the game. I think that's it, it's just wonderful. One thing that I I wish we had is enough people to play this game because I, I think one of the downsides for our gaming group is that there are, what, four or five of us who, who regularly play together, and the minimum for this game is six, which makes you it... You can play it with fewer, but it would be very hard. Yeah. Six seems doable. Eight's ideal. Yeah, so I I think that's, at least for us, a limiting factor in that we can play Space Alert a lot more frequently because they have, you know, a five-player variant if we've got everyone, and they, you know, they have all the way down to solo variants if you want to play by yourself. Yeah, two players is probably the worst number for Space Alert. It's it's tough. Yeah. yeah. But I, I don't see how you could do that with Captain Sonar. Yeah, it would become a different game entirely. So I'm not you know, sure maybe... I agree. I think it would come. Uh, I think it would become a different game entirely. But I think it might be interesting. I don't know. We might like want to try it. Two on two, Captain Sonar or something. Yeah, it would be. So from the games we played, the captain would like, have to do so many things. Yeah, but there's <laughs> the game drives forward very fast with the captain making quick decisions and. You know, it, almost trying to stay ahead of the other team. If the responsibilities were all given to two people, like it would just necessarily slow down, and it would become more of I don't know, more of a game of like not missing what the other team is doing. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to give it a shot. I suspect it's not very good. It's really fun with four people. I mean, just having a a, a whole table divided in half with that with the big beautiful divider. Yeah. With, yeah. You know, with eight people around a table is a really cool thing. There aren't many games that... Yeah, it provides a very unique experience. Exactly. Specifically for eight players and kind of a party game atmosphere. But that... it's it's so much more intense than most party games. Right. Yeah, there's a strong competition going on between the teams. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we didn't... Like, both of the games capture very well in that Space Alert captures this this cooperative teamwork feeling that you get when you play like sports together in a team. Captain Sonar has the same thing a little bit with the teamwork aspect, but more so with the competition aspect of oh, that. Definitely. You really, really want to take down the other team, especially because they instruct that you sit directly across from your role counterpart on the yeah. other team so if you're the no. captain you're directly facing the other captain and you see their smug little face on the other side and you just want to squash them no it, it, and so whereas space alert has this very fluid cooperation captain sonar has this very regimented structured cooperation where it's almost as if especially the the engineer and the first mate are like serving the captain like they they almost have to do their do their role in a way that they're trusting the captain to make the big high level decisions. Well, in both games, there's that element of trust, and that might be the yeah, key but to it's it. A, it's a different kind of trust. It's a more militaristic thing exactly. where you have a yeah. chain of command, right? And you know, if you're the engineer, you just do your thing, and you're trying to do your thing as best as possible, but. You have no say into the overall movement game. You you have to do your thing right if you're not prepared when you need to be prepared. Or like if you haven't prepared like the torpedo when you need to have it prepared, then there's a, a very bad penalty for that. Well, and it's specifically, again, the thing where it's like, oh, I've done my job poorly. I had one job. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I couldn't do it. Whereas in Space Alert, you're all in the same boat together. Like, it's a fairly flat... Like, you have one person who's nominally the captain, but that just means their actions resolve first in the turn order. Yeah, Mechanically, we... although you can make it much more significant than that in a cooperative teamwork sense. Oh, Captain Correa. <laughs> I'm the best captain. captain. <laughs> I think the closest thing you have to a Captain Sonar captain in Space Alert is the person who's doing the external threats. Because they're, they're seeing the vast majority of the cards, and they're the ones who are saying, I need you here doing this. Everyone plays a role, and it's great if you can hand cards off to people and say, I, just take care of this. I, I don't know if I agree, because with the external threats, it's still a matter of kind of understanding what the game is throwing at you and conveying information to other people. Like, well, the, you're yeah, that's the point. The, those the, are the most common threats, and that right. information is the most important information to communicate. So the I think, captain and captain sonar is much more active, much more well. The, uh, the again, ga- the game actively itself. trying to beat the other team, whereas where here, oh, I don't think I don't think they're s- similar. I, they're both the most important role. Gotcha, gotcha. That's what Ben was saying, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the Space Alert is by nature a reactionary game, and Captain Sonar is not. Yeah, Captain Sonar, you're trying to actively yeah, come out I, ahead. I, I Although, except right. for the radio operator who's who's reacting. But that, yeah. That's why I you think are... the external threats is more analogous to the radio operator, in that you're trying to understand the information being thrown at you and figure out what to do with it. Oh, that's a good point. But it's stretching the metaphor, so I don't know it how is. helpful that it, is. It is. And... At the end of the day, in Space Alert, everyone is on more equal footing, you know, as you yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a really interesting way to organize your game. Because I guess, in that sense, Space Alert does it in a much more traditional way. Everyone's kind of playing the same game. They're just doing it together, where there aren't a lot of games out there where you have very distinct roles like you do in Captain Sonar. Like, that's a new thing in games. I'm thinking games like um, Pandemic or Forbidden Desert, you have specific characters or, or abilities that you play with. But there's nothing forcing the uh, the person who, what's the, like, the architect who digs to go do that. It's just that they're way better at clearing sand. Yeah, that doesn't feel the same at all. I think Spirit Island kind of bridges the gap a bit because the roles, the, the different spirits are so asymmetrical. That, like, if you're the fear spirit, you just don't destroy things. You only generate fear. And if you're a defensive spirit, you you may possibly not have any abilities ever that do damage, but you help in other ways. That's kind of halfway between, but nothing as substantial as in Captain Sonar. Yeah, I mean, that's the most regimented co-op game for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that maybe in Captain Sonar... Um, someone said earlier, like, there are mini games in each station. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whereas in, in Spirit Island or Space Alert, like, everyone's, yeah, everyone's playing the same game. I guess a game we haven't played that, that does do that is Space Cadets, where everyone's playing their own mini game. What's the game we played? Dice? Space, Space Cadets yeah, Dice no, Duel. We have We've the Space Cadets Dice Duel, which does have different roles, but not quite as distinct. I know in that the was... original Space Cadets... It's exactly like Captain Sonar. Everyone literally has their own mini game. Maybe even more so than Captain Sonar. Well, now I'm thinking of other games in which you kind of have different roles. Axis and Allies is a weird one because you're all playing the same game, but it is a team versus team game. But the positional geographical realities of each of the nations make them very asymmetrical, where Russia's just trying to hold on as long as they can, and the U.S. is building up for attacks later, and Japan's trying to defend against the U.S., and the U.K. is struggling to hold on until the U.S. arrives. You know, it has those different incentive structures as as you had in, in actual war, World War II, but it has built in kind of the asymmetry. I don't, I don't know if there's anything to say about that. It's just something that came to mind for me. What about Fire in the Lake as a semi-teamwork co-op game? Oh, dear. Uh, Coin games. <laughs> That's another whole thing. That's, That's a fun. whole... Man, I, I shouldn't have even said the Axis and Allies thing. Unlike Space Alert, 
Games that I will frequently say no to. Coin games? Oh, have, Matt, have you played they're any? brilliant. Oh, yeah, but you're not, take get, a long time. you're not going to get them to the table in an hour's time. Yeah, the good thing about Space Lord is that it's a fairly complex game that takes half an hour if you include setup. I'm surprised you don't complain more about the setup on Space Lord because that's like the biggest barrier to for you in a couple games that we have. And Space Lord has a lot of things you have to set up. It's not too bad. It, it is fiddly. What other games are you it's thinking? It's bad of? in proportion to the time to play, but it's still yeah. Not the bad. the ratio of setup time to play time is very skewed. But we'll play three games of Space Alert. Yeah, you don't sit down and play plus, one game plus setup and teardown. It's still shorter than like a game of Gloomhaven. Yeah, fair. Talk about setup nightmares. Oh dear. Now we're on huge tangents. But <laughs> thoughtful gamer podcast rule: you cannot have too many tangents. I gotta codify these things. I keep having to tell guests this when they come on the podcast. When I had uh, Michael on, we went on right. so many tangents, and I had to reassure him. It would be way easier. Can't if have you too could, many tangents. You could just say, like, "Please refer to rule three. I should. I should really do this. Get a get a whiteboard and write them down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other one is you can't geek out too much. I had to mention that on the last one. Is there anything we else we want to talk about with these games? I think we covered them pretty thoroughly. I think we've covered them pretty deeply. So deep. Bottom of the Marianas Trench deep. Isn't it Mariana you... Trench? Is it? I don't think there's an S. It's a Marinera you know? Trench. But yeah, that's Space Alert and Captain Sonar, two very good games. I think, as I've very clearly hinted or maybe gone beyond hinted, I, I like Space Alert a bit better. I think Captain Sonar is quite good. I would like to get better at Captain Sonar because, again, I think that would make the gameplay that much more enjoyable. I think that in that sense, it's a bit of a contradiction because it is kind of a light party game. But I think the most fun you would have out of it is if you had two competitive, fairly competent teams against each other where the tension would be ratcheted up that much more. Can you imagine like competitive Captain Sonar? That would be I would, awesome. I would totally watch competitive Captain Sonar like, like a or, tournament. Or even like going to a tournament where like we the four of us go and just all day we play other teams. That'd be super fun. Yeah. I think that's where the game thrives, but I think it's because of the logistics of it, it's gonna just continue to be a good party game rather than perhaps a really brilliant tournament game i mean it could be i could totally see that being a great tournament game it'd be great especially if you add like expansions or or different different special abilities because there's a slot in 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 the abilities for different for custom abilities for maps and such right the scenario yeah yeah you you have a, a collection of scenarios that add you know different restrictions but but what i'm saying is if you had a thriving or at least somewhat thriving tournament scene you'd have the incentive for the designers to release new abilities and stuff like that and custom tournament scenarios or something anyway that's our podcast for today i hope you enjoyed this discussion on two great real-time cooperative or at least semi-cooperative games i guess captain sonar is cooperative it's just two teams of cooperation in competition it's both whatever ultimately less cooperation wait what I mean, on net, less cooperation. <laughs> no, there's no, like, killer alien robot that appears in the sea and you have to hunt it down together. <laughs> <laughs> now that would be an interesting Captain Sonar scenario. You know, something we haven't talked about that I'm going to talk about right now is a variant of Space Alert where you have two ships somehow competing would be awesome. It'd be interesting. <laughs> I don't but know now how you would do but, that. But, but now I'm thinking about... A Captain Sonar scenario where you have a ninth player who plays some, like, starting Leviathan or something, and the subs have to destroy that before they destroy each other. That's the ultimate Captain Sonar expansion, the Leviathan expansion. I could totally design that. Anyway. Then you have a Jaeger expansion where a Jaeger shows up underwater. Oh, is that... Like the Pacific Rim thing? Yeah. That's too much, Matt. Come on. Get real. Can there ever be too much? You could Isn't have... that another rule of this podcast? Will this podcast ever end? You can never have too much. What it if shouldn't you ha- make that rule. What if instead of a submarine, you had a giant robot underwater that swam around and like 
shot torpedoes out of its fist. I just I immediately want a reskin of Captain Sonar that is just Pacific Rim the board game. <laughs> what if what if it's Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus? Oh no, Captain Sonar. The podcast is <laughs> over, people. That's it. I'm closing shop. Sharknado. <laughs> oh no, no! You could add tornadoes in, like water tornadoes. Okay, I'm no. I'm closing. It's over. Check out the Thoughtful Gamer at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check out the review I just posted of Spirit Island a couple of days ago. Hit me up on Twitter, on Facebook. I am on there. And if you do enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to rate and review it on iTunes. That's super easy to do. If you really enjoy the podcast and want to help out financially, you can go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and watch our podcasts live and, and hear all the ridiculous, horrible torment that the other people give to me it's really as they try to de- de- derail the podcast and watch, and watch hockey during the podcast and drive me insane with love, I assume. But insane. You have a AMA coming up. Oh yeah, I do have an AMA coming up on R slash board games. That's on Reddit if you're not familiar with Reddit lingo. On the fourteenth at roughly two o'clock Eastern time. So go to reddit.com slash r slash board games on that date and ask me some questions that I'll answer any and all questions. I guarantee that there are no questions I won't answer, but I cannot promise that the answers will be satisfactory. (laughs) You should just end the podcast right there and leave everyone disappointed. (laughs) At the very least, they might be amusing. I will guarantee that the answers will all be satisfactory. You're going to force me to satisfactorily? Well, I got to put in some kind of contingent. What if they ask deeply personal questions? Then I just make a joke. That's how these things go. Oh, man. It just has to be a really good joke. If you want to help out financially but do not want to commit to Patreon because you have commitment issues or something wrong with you. That's to... the way to sell it. <laughs> I'm really tired, guys. Go to coffee.com slash the thoughtful gamer. That is spelled K-O-F-I. And you can pitch in a coffee, which is actually $3. That's how they define a coffee on this website, even though they don't spell it like coffee. Just go there and you'll see how it works. And all coffee contributions there are greatly appreciated. And Patreon subscribers, we have a great time on our Discord channel. Come on here, Discord. There's lots and, of good chat. Yeah, well, yeah, we talk about board games all the time and, and other random stuff, movies and what we're doing lately. And again, you can watch the podcast live if you join on the Patreon. Anyway, goodbye, everyone. 